I want to talk about Bishop Barclay's attack on the very notion of substance. Barclay, Hume, and a variety of later philosophers are idealists, something that goes back to ancient times within Indian philosophy, but something that really was new in the Western philosophical tradition. We've taken a look at Barclay's attacks on the distinction between primary and secondary qualities. That's something that really denies the distinction between the things that are mind-independent and the things that depend on the mind. And his attack really is to say, in the end, everything has to be pushed into the mind. We've talked about the problem of the relationship between mind and world. It is one of the most basic philosophical questions, and there is the danger of skepticism because it seems as if there's a potential gap between my mind and the world. My mind have a, may have a very different set of concepts from those that are actually applicable to the world. It may have all sorts of beliefs that are not true about the world. I may perceive things that are not at all going on in the world, and so I could be deceived about this or that thing, or maybe even systematically deceived about everything. Barclay's concerned about that gap between mind and world, and his solution is to take the world and push it up into the mind, to basically say nothing is before the mind but an idea, and everything that we talk about really is simply an idea. All objects are really simply mental. Everything depends on the mind. And that's the definition of idealism. Everything depends on the mind. So Barclay is somebody who is responding in part to Descartes and Locke and other philosophers who tried to defend a version of realism, one based on drawing a distinction between the concepts recognized in natural science and those that might be supplied by the mind. His point is, we can't draw that distinction. Science will not tell us in the end, he believes, which of our ideas correspond to those in the world and which don't. Instead, we're going to have to get rid of the problem of skepticism, either by surrendering to the skeptic, well, that's not really getting rid of the problem, it's just admitting we can't solve it, or by pushing the entire world into the mind, making everything mind-dependent. Well, that might be one way to go, but that's going to entail well, a number of surprising consequences. One is that everything really is a projection or con construction of the mind. There is no such thing as material substance. Nothing is truly external to the mind. Everything is really mental. Everything is fundamentally spiritual. And he does this, he presents the argument by attacking John Locke's idea of substance. Let's go back to Aristotle. Aristotle characterizes substance, which is the key idea behind his metaphysics, in a number of different ways. He says there are a number of criteria for substance, and as we saw in the complexities of metaphysics zeta, maybe nothing exactly fulfills all of those criteria. But one of the possibilities he considers, and takes to be one of the meanings of substance, is the substratum, the thing that underlies everything else, the thing that is that which underlies all of the qualities or properties that things have. He says the substratum is that of which everything else is predicated, while in itself it's not predicated of anything else. Well, we considered the example of a statue, in this case a bronze statue of a cat. And we could think about that and say, well, all right, there's matter there, the bronze, in a certain form, in that shape, which makes it a sculpture of a cat. And if we think about what the substance there is, we might mean that entire statue. We might be referring to the form or the essence in some way, the shape. We might be referring to the matter, to the bronze. And Aristotle says, well, to talk about the substratum, that would be something like talking about the bronze and saying the substance of the thing is bronze. Locke has a slightly different conception. It's inspired by Aristotle. He starts from Aristotle's starting point. But he ends up saying something that is somewhat surprising. He agrees with Aristotle that substance is what underlies things. It's what underlies other things, our predications, our predications of substance, ultimately. So it is itself not a quality, not a property, not a relation. It is what relations hold between. It is what properties are properties of. It's what qualities inhere in. So it's the basis for properties, qualities, relations. But what is that? In the end, Locke is forced to say, it is something, I know not what. But now Barclay and Hume can say something, you know not what. That doesn't have any content. That can't play any role in your theory. You don't even know what it is. You can't talk about it. It's not doing anything for you. Get rid of it. 
We experience only qualities, not any underlying substances. And there's the tension that we find in Locke's theory. He wants to be an empiricist, saying all ideas come from experience. But we experience the qualities. Maybe we experience relations. We don't experience what underlies them. And so where do we get an idea of substance? When he says something, I know not what, that's what a substance is, he's in effect me admitting he doesn't really have an idea of this. He has no content to that idea, and it's not something anyway that on his theory could come from experience. So what on earth is it doing? Here is Locke himself giving us the account that then Berkeley and Hume attack. If anyone will examine himself concerning his notion of pure substance in general, he'll find that he has no other idea of it all but only a supposition of he knows not what support of such qualities which are capable of producing simple ideas in us. Notice that. He knows not what support of such qualities. If anyone should be asked what's the subject wherein color or weight inheres, he would have nothing to say but the solid extended parts. And if it were demanded, what is it that solidity and extension adhere in, he wouldn't be much in a much better case than the Indian before mentioned, who saying that the world was supported by a great elephant was asked what the elephant rested on, to which his answer was a great tortoise. But being again pressed to know what gave support to the broad-backed tortoise, he replied, something he knew not what. Well, that is a sort of analysis that is surprising to hear out of Locke, because he speaks about this hypothetical philosopher from India who is giving us this rather, well, uh, imaginative story about what supports the world. I'm not aware of any Indian philosopher who actually did that. But in any case, Locke is saying, well, there's this story about a guy who says this. It's sitting on the back of an elephant, on the back of a tortoise, and then on something I know not what. But, well, if qualities are like that, if qualities are sometimes qualities of other qualities, but then ultimately those have to adhere in something. But what is that thing if it's not a quality? It's something I know not what. So here we have an image of the world on the back of an elephant, on the back of a tortoise, but then on, well, something I know not what. On some kind of support, surely it can't be just there by itself, or in Bertrand Russell's version, it can't be an infinite series of turtles. It can't be turtles all the way down. So what can we say? I think what Locke is giving us here is something like an infinite regress argument of the kind we've encountered a number of different times. There are qualities. Every quality has to inhere in something. That can't go on to infinity. So there's got to be something that is not itself a quality in which qualities ultimately adhere. And that's something that he calls substance. That's this ultimate substratum. That which we predicate other things of, it is never predicated of anything else, to go back to Aristotle's characterization. Well, here's the kind of thought experiment he has in mind. Take a look at the squirrel. We can ask, okay, good, it is a squirrel. We can say it's got all sorts of qualities, right? It's brown and white, it's furry, it is reaching in this case. Well, all of those qualities are qualities of the squirrel. And now we can ask, well, what is it that is reaching? The squirrel. What is it that's furry? The squirrel. What, it is, what is it that's brown and white? The squirrel. Good. But what is it that's the squirrel? Oh, now it's much harder. If we ask about any of the qualities, we can say it's the squirrel that has those qualities. That's something like talking about the underlying substance in Aristotle's sense. But now Locke goes further. Locke says, what is it that is the squirrel? What is it, once we get down to the primary qualities, that is the thing in which those primary qualities inhere? Locke's only answer can be something, I know not what. That statue, he can't even rest content with the bronze. What is it that is the bronze? Something, I know not what. Well, Berkeley finds this bizarre. What do you mean, something, I know not what? The world ultimately consists of substances. What are substances? Uh, something, I know not what. That's a pretty disturbing and disappointing answer. So here is the way things go in the dialogues between Hylas and Philonus that Berkeley uses to attack Locke's ideas of primary quality and hear his idea of substance. Philonus, who is speaking for Berkeley basically, says, 
What shall we say then of your external object, these outside individual substances? Is it a material substance or no? Hyla says, it is a material substance with the sensible qualities inhering in it. He's giving the answer that Locke wants to give that Aristotle would give. Philona says, how then can a great heat exist in it? Since you own, it cannot in a material substance. In other words, heat is the kind of thing that may correspond to some primary qualities of the object, but that we tend to feel. Part of what's motivating the dialogue at this point is the thought that water can feel cool or can feel warm depending upon the kind of temperature we've been exposed to. So is the water itself warm? Is it cold? What is the temperature of the water? Well, to one person it can feel hot. To another person it might feel cold. Somebody else says it's lukewarm. That heat can't be in the water itself or it wouldn't vary in that way. It's got to be something that is, in some sense, a secondary quality in the person. However, if it's in the person, then it looks like, well, it's not in the object itself. So, think about the same thing with respect to another kind of secondary quality. For example, color. Falona says that the colors are really in the tulip that I see is manifest. Neither can it be denied that this tulip may exist independent of your mind or mind, or mine, but that any immediate object of the senses, that is, any idea or combination of ideas, should exist in an unthinking substance or exterior to all minds is in itself an evident contradiction. So the color, we want to say, is something that is secondary. It's a secondary quality. It's contributed by the mind. It's not in the object itself. But we also want to say the quality is something that is in the tulip. And now we end up saying, I, I, wait, <laughs> the quality is in the tulip, but it's contributed by the mind. So there's something contributed by the mind in the tulip? That doesn't make any sense. So in what sense can this be a quality in the tulip if it's something that is being contributed by my mind? Maybe we could say, well, it's not in the tulip at all. But we talk about that, the substance, as something in which the quality is in here. But it looks like here, well, the, the, the quality of having that color or having that quality of feeling hot, or whatever that secondary quality is, it's going to look like all of those, well, are contributed by the mind, but we speak of them as if they're in the object. There's a kind of contradiction there. Are they really in the mind, or are they in the object? And here, Barclay is complaining, Locke seems to want it both ways. That doesn't quite work. So, Philonus continues. He says, I can't imagine how this follows from what you said just now. To wit, that the red and the yellow were on the tulip you saw, since you don't pre pretend to see that unthinking substance. In other words, there are two problems really here. In part, the red and the yellow are supposed to be in the tulip, but they're also supposed to be contributed by the mind and not corresponding to anything in the tulip. Ah, contradiction number one. That seems disturbing. But the second thing is that he's making the point that the red and the yellow, they're supposed to be on the tulip, but wait a minute, wait a minute. What are you experiencing? You're experiencing the qualities. You're not experiencing that underlying substratum. So actually, you don't have experience of the tulip at all. So what is this idea of substance, of, of an external thing that they're supposed to adhere in? Moreover, if you're Locke, you think that everything before the mind is actually an idea. So the red and the yellow end up being ideas. The tulip ends up being an idea. So where's the place? for this individual substance that could be really material and really outside the mind. There's no place left for it. So I think there are several different contradictions here that Philonus sees in the Lockean picture. Locke's trying to have it both ways, and he's trying to say, I'm getting all my ideas from experience, but all the things I experience seem to be qualities, and I do it by means of having an idea before the mind. So where is anything outside the mind that I have access to and moreover, especially even if you grant me the qualities, where do I get anything they inhere in? This idea of a substratum, this idea of a substance, where could that possibly come from? Now, I think Barclay is twisting, in other words, that infinite regress argument against Locke. Philonus continues, every corporeal substance being the substratum of extension must have in itself another extension, by which it's qualified to be a substratum and so on to infinity. I ask whether this be not absurd in itself, and repugnant to you what you granted just now, to wit, that the substratum was something distinct from and ex exclusive of extension. Let's go back to the turtles. It's as if 
the world is on the back of an elephant, on the back of a turtle, but now, wait a minute, if these things require support, what's required by the su for, to support the turtle? Well, something I know not what. Okay, put that in. Put in something you know not what. What supports it? Doesn't it need a support too? And why won't that go on to infinity? So this idea of a substratum, that which underlies everything else. Hold on a second. If everything has to be supported by something, has to inhere in it, has to have this kind of metaphysical support, well, what does the substratum rest on? Aristotle's idea is, well, nothing. It's the ultimate ground of this. It doesn't go back to infinity. It's not turtles all the way down. At some point, you get to what all of it rests on, this idea of substance, this one underlying thing. But Berkeley doesn't see how we can stop it there. Once we start going on this, this inheres in that, and that inheres in this, and that inheres in some ultimate substratum that I can't really describe. Well, if you can't describe it, the only thing that you can describe are qualities. They're the things that generate ideas. So wait a minute. Um, doesn't that have to be a quality after all? And don't you get into an infinite regress? Don't you end up with a picture of turtles all the way down? I think what he's doing here is taking that argument from Locke and turning it on its head in something like the following way. Here's how we might describe the infinite regress argument in Locke. There are qualities. Every quality has to adhere in something. That can't go on to infinity. So there's got to be something, not itself a quality, in which they ultimately adhere. But wait a minute. There's got to be something that is not a quality, so we can't characterize it. It's something I know not what, in which things ultimately adhere. Berkeley is saying, look, that can't be right. In the end, we can't have our entire theory rest on something we can't describe like that. We can't say the world ultimately consists of substance. What is that? Something I know not what. That won't do. And besides, everything's supposed to be supported by something. What's it supported by? So Berkeley rejects the conclusion. Well, then there are only three options. If he rejects the conclusion of that argument, he's got to reject one of the premises. So either there are no qualities at all, or we get do allow it to go to, on to infinity. We say, yeah, it can be turtles all the way down. Or what Berkeley, in fact, chooses, it's not true that these things need something to inhere in. The quality doesn't need some substance to support it. We don't need to look for a substratum. The qualities aren't functioning that way. And so his version of the argument is to say that conclusion is false. And the only premise that it makes sense to reject is the second one. So if that conclusion is absurd, because we have no access to any such substratum, and couldn't say anything about it if we did, well, we got to conclude that qualities don't have to inhere in anything. What he turns to, then, is the bundle theory. What Aristotle called substances, or objects, or things, they're just collections or bundles of properties. There is nothing in which all those properties inhere. There is no thing that actually has all those characteristics. They're just the characteristics. We don't experience anything tying them together. We just experience the qualities. So we have no reason to believe that there is anything that actually holds them together, anything in which they adhere. In fact, they don't have to adhere any, to anything. So what holds them together? Our own mental activity, customs, habits of the mind, to use Hume's phraseology. The objects are simply bundles of qualities. They don't come already bundled. We do the bundling. We do the bundling by grouping those qualities together. So the identity of the objects is something that itself is dependent on the mind. Berkeley puts it this way. If there were external bodies, it's impossible we should ever come to know it. If there weren't, we might have the very same reasons to think there were that we have now. After all, we encounter these qualities. We assume they're just bundles of qualities. That's all a thing is. Or we think there's some hidden substratum beneath them. It says, look, our evidence for the one could not be any different from our other evidence from the other. We can't really distinguish these two hypotheses. We have no reason to believe there's anything but a collection of qualities there, any substratum in which they all adhere, anything supporting them. So he ends up saying, look, these are bundled together. <laughs> the various sensations or ideas imprinted on the sense, however blended and combined together by whatever objects they compose, can't exist otherwise than the mind perceiving them. There isn't a substratum. There is just 
the mental construction, the mind grouping certain qualities together because of the resemblance and contiguity of its own ideas. So he says, what do we say about the absolute existence of unthinking things? It's unintelligible. Their essay is percipi. Per He's using Latin here. In other words, their being is simply to be perceived. They can't have any existence out of the mind or thinking things that perceive them. So this is Barclay's maybe most fav famous slogan, esse est percipi. To be is to be perceived. For unthinking things, he says, to exist is to be perceived. They couldn't possibly exist out of the minds or thinking things that perceive them. We have access, in other words, only to what's before the mind. For a thing to exist is simply for it to be perceived, be the kind of thing that can be in a mind. It can exist only if it's perceived. Some later idealists, by the way, make it into perceivable. But the idea is that the object is simply constituted by the perceptions, the actual and possible perceptions of the things, by our ideas of the thing, by the bundling of those things together. That's what the object is. It's not something outside of us in which all of those things adhere. It's not something that is represented outside of us by the ideas in our own head and the perceptions. It's just the bundle of those perceptions. People have toyed around with this a little. Here's a plaque on Barclay's house. Philosopher, 18, or 1685 to 1753, is perceived to have lived and died here. Notice it doesn't say he did, it says is perceived. And so that's a bit of a tongue-in-cheek tribute to Barclay and his philosophy. For what are the forementioned objects, Barclay writes, but the things we perceive by sense? And what do we perceive besides our own ideas or sensations? Isn't it plainly repugnant that any one of these or any combination of them should exist unperceived? We can't have unperceived ideas floating around. Ideas are in minds. Perceptions are perceptions in minds. If objects are simply combinations of ideas or combinations of perceptions, they are mental. They are in minds. They don't have any external existence. So Barclay is concerned to say, really, the entire world is dependent on the mind. It's something like a mental construction. We have these ideas, these ideas of qualities, perceptions of qualities. Those constitute the objects, and we don't need to postulate any external substratum in which they are. In fact, we don't have need to postulate anything outside of the mind. He puts the point poetic. All the choir of heaven and furniture of the earth in a word, all those bodies which compose the mighty frame of the world, have not any subsistence without a mind, that their being is to be perceived or known. Consequently, so long as they are not actually perceived by me or don't exist in my mind or that of any other created spirit, they must either have no existence at all or else subsist in the mind of some eternal spirit. Being is simply being perceived. There is no other substance than spirit or that which perceives. There is nothing but minds. The universe consists of minds and the constructions of minds, the bundles of ideas and perceptions in minds. That's it. Everything is ultimately mental. This does raise an obvious question. <laughs> Wait, so to be is to be perceived. If I'm not perceiving something, does it go out of existence? Here is a limerick that makes the point. There once was a man who said, God must think it exceedingly odd if he finds that this tree continues to be when there's no one about in the quad. We do tend to think things exist even apart from our perceiving of them. It's not as if I think the room ex stops existing when I no longer perceive it. So it seems like a bizarre thing. <laughs> but here is a limerick that gives in effect Barclay's answer. Dear sir, your astonishment's odd. I am always about in the quad. And that's why the tree will continue to be, since observed by yours faithfully, God. In other words, God's perceiving things all the time. Of course things don't go out of existence when you stop perceiving them. Maybe nobody's perceiving them. And so, let's say there are parts of the world that nobody is seeing now, that nobody has ever seen. Does that mean they don't exist? No, of course not, because God's perceiving all of them all the time. So there are thinking beings. To be is to be perceived for something we consider a body. But for a mind, to be is something like to perceive. So actually God exists here and God is the universal perceiver. God is perceiving everything all the time. So to be 
is to be perceived, but don't worry that that means that if we all stop perceiving something, it's going to go out of existence. No, God will continue. So actually, to be perceived, the way Barclay's treating it, is more or less to be perceived by God. But it's also to be perceived by any spirit, any mind. And God's mind is just the one that's attending to everything all the time, in which all of the qualities that are there are reflected and represented. But actually, that's something that solves the problem of things going out of existence. It looks as if the world is material. It looks as if it's independent of us. It's not as if I close my eyes, open them again, and everything's different, and everything's gone, poof. No, it doesn't happen that way because God is the one constant universal perceiver. And so it would seem as if the evidence would support the hypothesis that there are things external to us. But that's not because that idea even has any content and not because we have any evidence for it. It's simply because the constancy of God's perceptions make it feel that way. So we look at the trees in the quad, we can say, yes, they can exist even if we're not looking at them, God's perceiving them. But nevertheless, their being is being perceived. There is no material substratum. There is no substance independent of a mind. Everything in the end is mental in its very essence. Everything depends on the mind. Hence, Barclay's idealism. It's a surprising departure from common sense, but he thinks it's the only possible defense of common sense. It's the only way of eliminating that gap between perception and reality, between mind and world. If to be is to be perceived, then there is no such thing as a gap between mind and world. To be existent in the world is simply to be the kind of thing that is perceived. And so gap is gone. So a surprising, seemingly not at all commonsensical philosophy. But Barclay says, but look what it does. It rescues common sense and rescues you from the danger of skepticism. It says you do know about the world. Why? Your mind is equipped to do it, not because there's some mystical convergence, but because the world is itself mental. Its very essence is to be the kind of thing that you can perceive and understand.